Good morning and welcome to Curly and Children's uh, Thursday morning Grand Rounds. This is Dr. Henschel. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today our speaker, who is Dr. Ryan Fulton. Dr. Fulton is a graduate of the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in 2013. We were fortunate enough to have him join our faculty in 2016 when he graduated from his residency, and he practices uh, pediatric medicine in Daleville, Virginia. He is currently faculty at the Virginia Tech Krillian School of Medicine, as well as VCOM. Dr. Fulton is the co-director of quality improvement for the pediatric residency, as well as an advisor for the advocacy rotation. <clears throat> he has absolutely practiced his passion for quality and advocacy since his resident years, and has developed a strong quality improvement curriculum, including all of the residents. He has also worked as an advisor um, for individual residents and has been a mentor for the pediatric interest group at Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine. He has been a true asset to the faculty here at Carillion. And also regionally, he is the American Academy of Pediatrics representative for Southwest Virginia. And nationally, he serves as a, a national faculty on the Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners. It is with pleasure that I introduce you to Dr. Ryan Fulton for this great Grand Rounds. Hello, thank you, Hello. Dr. Mitchell, for that introduction. Uh, and so we're gonna get started here. Uh, I have a just a real brief uh, presentation on kind of the introductions of quality improvement and how every one of us can kind of use quality improvement in our everyday practice. Uh, this is going to be very basic. So if anyone's done any quality, this may be too basic, but I wanted to kind of get a, kind of everyone to dip their foot in the water here and see if they could understand and, and move forward with it. So. First things first, so I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I also want to disclose that I'm not a, a, a super expert in quality. The reason I'm giving you this presentation today is because I know what it's like to work full time in an office and do a large national quality improvement project with lots of different pieces involved. So. I, I hope to kind of be a mentor for everyone as we move forward in this and know that you can do it and it's definitely a possibility to, to get through these quality projects, even though they seem daunting. So our objectives today, we're gonna acquire an understanding of what quality improvement is. We're going to apply QI principles to everyday work. We're also gonna recognize what QI work has already been done uh, within the residency and we are also gonna see the future of QI here at Crowley and Children's. So first, what is it? What is quality improvement? A formal and systematic data guided approach to continuously improving healthcare and patient outcomes. So it's a formal definition of what QI is, but why do we do it? So QI, uh, primarily is going to help outcomes and experience of our patients. That's our overarching number one goal. Uh, the secondary goal is, as we know, the American Board of Pediatrics requires some continuing education on the topic of quality improvement. Uh, quality improvement work can also be a means to bring teams together uh, that practice differently. And finally, you can use QI to improve the flow of the system. We've all experienced system flow issues and quality improvement is a mechanism uh, of which we can use to improve that flow within the system. So how do we go about doing or performing quality improvement? First, you have to develop your question, then you have to create your team, and then finally execute your change. So first we wanna talk about how to develop a, a project. There are many different tools, as you can see in the above images, that uh, different quality improvement projects utilize to get from point A to point B. We'll be focusing primarily on the first bullet, the model for improvement. Uh, that's also your first picture on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, we're uh, going through all of these different quality improvement models, the FADE, Six Sigma, CQI, TQI, seven steps, 
that would be a whole nother lecture, which I'm happy to give at another time. Um, but it would be very time consuming. So we're going to focus on the model for improvement. So how do we execute the model for improvement? So there's three questions. First, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, we establish what we're trying to accomplish with most of the time we use an aim statement. So this is how good do we want to get and by when. And we're going to go into the details of the aim statement here shortly, but that's kind of your first question that you want to ask. Next, the changes. So what change can we make that will result in improvement? Sometimes you already have an idea of what the change is, so you don't have to necessarily go in order, but these three questions are primary in what you want to ask uh, before you go into the study. Next, you have measures. How will we know a change is an improvement? What are we going to measure? And we'll talk about each of these specifically. Then, once you have those three questions answered, you want to move on to what's called Plan, Do, Study, Act cycles, or PDSA cycles. This enables a rapid testing and learning process and allows for in incremental testing of change. So first, we want to develop our aim statement. The aim statement, again, helps to understand what we we're trying to improve. The important thing to utilize is a SMART aim statement. So SMART is our, uh, our acronym that we use here, and we're going to break it down. So you want to be specific. You want to be very specific or as specific as you can be about the improvement that you are trying to accomplish. What, uh, what is this specific improvement? And then uh, you want to make the statement quantifiable, so measurable. How will we know we reached our goal? And we don't want to get uh, next, the next bullet achievable. Uh, is it a possible goal? So um, do you know that it's uh, a possible outcome? Is it definitely something that your practice or your group can perform? Um, don't, we don't want to get too crazy with it, but we want to make sure that it will make an impact. And that goes into the next bullet, which is relevant. Does this goal really matter? Obviously, when you started your thought process for the project, you thought the goal mattered. But once you start to um, unravel it a bit more, is it going to truly impact your practice? And then we want to make sure that our goal is time bound. By when would you like to accomplish your goal? Again, we don't want to get too crazy with it, but we want to make sure that we have an outline of what our goal is time-wise, so we're not um, wasting time in it, and we actually have some driver behind what we're doing. Okay, so when you develop your SMART aim, uh, uh, the aim on the left-hand side, this is I call, what I call your running for office statement, so you want to improve vaccination rates of HPV throughout the hospital system. It's all pretty and nice and simple um, when you say it, but it means very little when you don't have quantifiable goals. So if you look at your right-hand side, this is what a smart aim example would be. So we want to improve completion rates of HPV vaccine series for children nine years and older by 50% over the next six months. So we're specific, we're measurable, we're achievable, it's relevant to our practice, and we put a time binding on it for six months. So that is what our goal for a SMART AIM would look like. So you got your AIM. Now, we need to build our team. So we have to identify leadership. Uh, <clears throat> and so leadership will give you pull and provides authority and guidance to the system. In this scenario, a chair or a senior leadership perspective would be uh, a good person to have on your team because they can sway things in certain directions. The next person you want to identify is a champion. Your champion will be the primary contact person and leader of the project. So this is likely to be you if you, this is your project. And then there's QI experts like myself that will help you get through the technical aspects of the project. Um, myself, Dr. Bektani, and the team of uh, our QI team within the residency, uh, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, is going to be a great asset to all of you when you go down the road to develop these projects. So your team should also include everyone that's involved. So you want to reach out. You want to reach out to residents, nurses, medical students, front staff, administration, and particularly parents. So all 
you want to reach out to everyone that's going to have a hand in this project. So if it's in your office, the front staff greets the patient, the nurses room the patient, you're going to see the patient, the medical students, the resident, everyone that's involved that has a hand in this um, should, be involved, uh, should be included in your initial team building. Now, uh, parents are a big part uh, of what has been included in QI, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, next, you want to develop roles. So <clears throat> your team, just like in a code situation, it's important to develop roles early so everyone knows their objectives within the team. And then finally, you want to cultivate that QI culture. This type of team development will help to cultivate uh, the culture as it shows that change is made as a group with many voices rather than the ideas of those on top or in senior leadership. So here's our example. Improved completion rates of HPV vaccine series for children nine years and older by 50% over the next six months. So who do we want to have involved? Um, we want to involve registration because the patient is going to come in and they're going to meet the registration. There's going to be posters up uh, at registration for our HPV project and what HPV means and all that stuff is happening in the waiting room, assuming that we are using our waiting room. Um, and then the next step, we want to involve nursing. Uh, there's been lots of studies that look at nursing and how, it, how the nurses affect patient interaction. Uh, a lot of those studies focus on the race of the nurse or the religion of the nurse and how it relates to the patient or the patient's family and how those nursing relationships are actually very impactful for the decisions that the patient or their, or their family make about their care. So if you have a nurse that is supportive of the project, that is only going to further the movement of the project. Finally, we want to make sure all of the physicians um, and ACPs are included um, in the team as well, because they're going to be on the front line of uh, talking to the patient and, um, and discussing the HPV vaccine. Finally, as we mentioned before, parents are becoming a large part of quality work within pediatrics. This gives a different perspective on projects and allows those key players to give their input. So in our example here, when we're improving HPV rates, the goal parent to be involved would be a parent that originally didn't want to vaccinate and then was converted to a vaccinating parent. Um, you can also include parents that don't like to vaccinate and parents that do like to vaccinate, um, but it would make meetings uh, tremendously longer. So <clears throat> you want to find someone who's had a conversion so that way they can address some of those parent uh, barriers and you can better move forward with your project. Okay, now we're going to talk about measures. So we have our aim statement, we have our team built. Now we want to establish a measure. Uh, what is, so first we have to find some baseline data. So if for our example, how many HP vaccine completions do we already have? Um, so we want to kind of dig in EPIC or, or whatever uh, system you're using and utilize what our baseline data is because we have to go from A to B, we need to know what A looks like. Next, we have to identify some gaps. This is a bit more challenging in the process. This could be knowledge gaps, educational gaps, uh, gaps in published literature, gaps in data from baseline collection. Not all gaps will be identified at this time and will likely be identified throughout the project as you move, but you want to try to identify as many gaps as you can this early point, at this early point. Once we have our baseline data uh, and we want to establish a trend, so as it relates to the HPV example, uh, are there trends provider dependent? Uh, are they population dependent? Are they insurance dependent, et cetera? So you want to see what kind of trends already exist in your data. Now we use our SMART aim to quantify the change that we are looking uh, to make as it relates to the baseline. And then determine the next steps as it relates to PDSA cycles and other endpoints. So what types of measures can we use? Or what kind of things can we measure? We know that we can measure outcomes of our changes based on data collection. We can also measure the process. Um, uh, for example, how did we get patients to accept vaccines? And then finally, there's balancing measures. These measures are unintended outcomes of changes made during the project, good or bad. Uh, as an example, does more HPV discussion increase wait times 
uh, for other well visits due to time constraints. So that's a balancing measure, something that we'll have to see as we go through. So after we start establishing measures and we're going through our project, there are ways of tracking our measures. So how do we visualize it? One way is to use, is the utilization of run charts. Here's an example from our national QI uh, project iScreen on screening patients for social determinants of health. This is one run chart of about, let's see, there was nine run charts that we ran for this project. Um, and <clears throat> at the top, you'll see the goal. Uh, so our goal was 90% screeners, screening. And then uh, three practices are represented by the colored trend line. And then the teal was all 20 practices across the U.S. that were associated with the project and the trend across those. Some unique things to point out uh, are that they're uh, important about run charts is you, when you utilize run charts, you want to make sure you identify certain points along the time uh, cycle. So we initiated the hunger vital signs screening uh, at cycle nine. And so this is important because if someone who doesn't know is looking at your run chart, they look, it looks like you've done nothing for nine cycles, um, and then it went up. So you want to be able to look at it and see why it went up. And then at the top, you'll see um, at cycle 13, that was the end of our project, but we continue to track data. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the dip there in a few minutes uh, and why that's important. So. How do we make a change? Critical thinking uh, is an important part of making the change. Flowcharts can help visualize the system-wide impact of change. These can be uh, uh, fishbone diagrams or different types of diagrams that are utilized when you're looking at flow of a process. You want to break down a complex process into smaller steps and identify barriers that you may have along the way. So uh, in our HPV example, you want to say, okay, the nurse talks about the vaccine, and then the doctor talks about the vaccine, and then the paperwork is given. So all of these processes, you can identify at each point where there would be a barrier along the way. So then you can address the barrier, or your team can help identify scripting to address the barrier prior to it actually happening. Finally, our next benchmarking, how will your change compare to what is considered best practice? So you want to make sure that you're not reducing um, the practice that's going on and that you meet or exceed what's best practice, what's considered best practice uh, for your particular uh, topic. And then how can we utilize technology to help make this change? So for example, in our HPV uh, project, we're utilizing iPads to help uh, uh, parents that are not vaccinating. We ask them to fill out a brief uh, survey about why they've chosen not to do that. And so that's all uh, part of the technology aspect of the project. Finally, a change concept is a general notion or approach to change that has been found in the literature to be useful in developing specific ideas for changes that lead to improvement. So if you're really not sure, you do your flow diagram, you know you want to target HPV vaccination, but you're not sure what concept to use. So do you want to eliminate waste? Do you want to optimize inventory? Do you want to manage time, focus on variation? These are different types of change concepts that have been shown to be helpful in uh, previous literature. Okay, so testing changes. Why do we test changes? We always want to be adapting to the change. The ability to change as side effects occur within the system uh, is very helpful. Small tests of change are key to minimize uh, resistance within the system. Um, for example, HPV education at one office, then test understanding. So you want to do it, roll it out with just your patients, and then you want to roll it out with just your office, and then you want to roll it out uh, at multiple offices. <clears throat> each, each section of that is a PDSA cycle, and you're testing understanding and getting better at what you're doing. Showing small tests of change and how it works will increase the belief among those that are skeptical, skeptical of the process or the change you want to implement. Okay, so testing changes with the PDSA cycle. So we answer our three questions. We're now moving to the PDSA cycles. Remember, you can do PDSA for your whole project. Then you can make a PDSA for each minor change along the way. It looks like a lot of work. 
So I don't want anyone to zone out, okay? You're already doing this every day. You do PDSA cycles on every patient that you see. You just don't know that it's formed in this structure, okay? So we plan, we do, we study, we act with every single door and room we walk in and patient we uh, interact with. So first, you want to plan. You want to set your aims, your measures, your ideas. Uh, you want to question and predict what may happen. You want to know the who, the what, the where, the when. Anything that can be planned, which this uh, circle kind of shows you that everything is equal, but most of the time the plan is actually the majority of the circle. Then you want to do, once you have a plan, you want to try your planned intervention. Remember, small scale first is always important. Then you want to start to analyze what you've done. So you study, you complete the analysis of the data, you compare to the prediction, and then you act, you adopt, you can reject the study, you can reject what you've tried because it didn't work, or you can modify the change and then start a new PDSA cycle. So this is a great representation of how PDSA cycles will continue to evolve and change and grow. So <clears throat> we want to continue to repeat the PDSA PDSA cycles until the goals are obtained or the aim is completed. We may need a new aim at this stage. So I'm going to read that again. We may need a new aim. So just because you have a smart aim at the beginning of your project does not mean that you have to finish the project with the same aim. This is not cheating. This does not uh, diminish the effectiveness of the project in any way. You're just going to roll with it. You're going to roll through the PDSA cycles, and you're going to determine whether that data represents your SMART aim or not. If it doesn't, or let's see something happens, you reach a, a barrier that can't be overcome, you just shift and utilize it on education or some kind of different aim that allows you to complete the original project that you set out to do, but with a different aim. All right, so improvement occurs without studies, but organized studies are how we show that one specific change or a group of changes affects the expected outcome. Anyone who has done any research, not just quality, knows that when you start one project, it will grow exponentially. The key is to keep focused on your specific aim. You want to pass off other parts to other people that are involved, but always focus on your aim. Sometimes it's, it's harder than it sounds. Finally, once change is implemented and we are seeing improvement, the hard part is just beginning. Any new change has to be followed and made sure it is sustained. So we're going to jump back to slide 15 here. Um, at the end of the project, you'll notice that most of the practices dropped off in collection of social determinants of health screening. Uh, or documentation of social determinants of health. And that wasn't just seen within our offices, that was seen on a national level with all 20 practices on that TO line. So this is why it's important to sustain change. When I was in the, well, when we were doing that project, I was having meetings with each individual practice monthly. And then the meetings uh, reduced after the end of the project to every three months. Um, that reduction, uh, I didn't have, uh, monthly meetings uh, to remind everyone to document the change and all this, and it, it, people lapse, people get, fall back into old habits, things happen. And so uh, sustaining the change is an important part of QI. So is change easy? Obviously never easy. It's very easy to be overwhelmed by change, but through the steps of QI, it makes it easier to follow a thought and a project to the end there will be resistance to change. Sometimes individuals are threatened by change, and then once completed, as we discussed, there is a tendency to fall into old habits. So because change is hard, sometimes we have to address the emotional side of things. There is stress with learning new things. There will be disruption to workflow. It is important to listen to the concerns and identify barriers. So when we're having individual meetings with our team, it's important for everyone to try to speak about the barriers that they're feeling. Whether these are barriers that everyone feels or just one person feels, it's important to try to address those barriers to move forward with the project and improve buy-in from the participants. Uh, these different identification or uh, identified barriers can be um, uh, worked through through PBSA cycles of their own. 
you can have multiple PDSA cycles running at one time uh, throughout your project. <clears throat> okay, so permanent change. How do we get permanent change within a project? So we have to market the change. We have to train all, everyone that's involved. We have to add change into job descriptions, policies, and procedures so that it's sustainable and impactful to the whole group, even after the project is gone. We have to assign day-to-day -day ownership of new processes. And then we also utilize our senior leadership to remove barriers that are out of our, uh, or beyond our depth. Okay, so that's the basics of QI. Now, I wanna talk about quality improvement at Carillion Children's. So, Dr. Bektani and I have been hard at work creating a QI curriculum for the residency. The curriculum was implemented last year and the current third years were the first class to participate in the capstone project. So, all pediatric residents are now required to complete a QI project during their time in our residency program. The first year focuses on QI basics through a program called EQIP. These, this way, the residents, the interns will get, uh, will be able to see kind of the things that we've already talked about throughout this presentation. And they'll be able to run a small QI project on their own patient base in their continuity clinic. The second and third years complete their capstone project. The resident will select a physician champion to help lead the project. They assemble their own team, nurses, medical students, administrators, et cetera. Uh, and then in the winter of their third year, so they start in their second year, and then they move through the capstone project, and then the winter of their third year, uh, which will happen on December 10th this year, um, we will have a QI, a resident QI grand rounds. And we'll kind of have a little abstract presentation of each of the individual projects that have been completed that year. <clears throat> In spring of their third year, they will submit the, and present at the Korean Research Day. And we hope to encourage the residents to apply and present at regional as well as national levels uh, in addition to the Korean Research Day. And then after the spring of their third year, um, if they have you know, nothing going on with looking for jobs and things like that, uh, they have opportunities for manuscript completion prior to graduation. So here's an introduction to our team. So myself and Dr. Bektani, our co-directors of the team, we have uh, lots of different parts uh, along the way. We have uh, Matthew Suckup, which is our grant application and money management along with our team. And then we have Rita McCandles, who's our literature resource person, uh, Kelly Hurt, QI background and IRB assistant, Sherry Wicker and Mariah Rudd are helping with education and study design as well as poster development. Dr. Jaimez is our clinic epidemiologist as well as long, along with study quality and design. And then we have our Prillian Health Analytics Research Team who deals with analytics and uh, stat, uh, stats management. <clears throat> so the physician champions, they're an integral part in the success of these projects. The benefits to the champion include support a supported research opportunity. So if you have a project that you think you wanna do and you can interest a resident in um, going along with the project, they can support, this program can support your research. There's also CME or MOC potential. So we all have to get CME and MOC, but it's actually a little bit easier uh, to, uh, to get this uh, than you may think. So, for instance, uh, I presented our ice cream project at the AAP Council uh, on Quality Improvement and Patient Safety uh, nationally last year. Now, I had already received MOC credit for the project, but if you develop your own project, like many of the residents have done that we'll talk about here shortly, and you submit and get accepted to present at the Council on Quality Improvement, all you have to do is fill out a little thing and there's some uh, things that you have to have on your poster but you are automatically uh, given MOC credit for your project and those that are involved in your poster if your poster is accepted. These projects will also count towards our scholarly activity goals for the department. Okay, so projects are, that are underway currently. So Dr. Ali is, look, is working with the Safe Environment for Every Kid, the SEEK project. This project is involved in every single uh, outpatient pediatric office right now. Um, and that's a large project that will, that will likely be handed off to the next, uh, the next group as it's a continually moving uh, uh, 
point. But remember, let's go back to our basics. So Dr. Ali had an aim statement that was very specific to what she wanted to complete. And then each individual resident that kind of takes up the mantle of this project will also have an individual aim statement. So that allows a project to uh, persist in perpetuity within the residency, and every person is allowed to have an aim statement and present a poster on their specific aim within a larger project. Dr. Griffin is working on reducing uninsured patients in the continuity clinic by improving access to DSS services. Dr. Kalonji is, uh, is working on reducing time to discharge on the pediatric inpatient unit. Dr. Miller is working on increasing patient understanding of temperature evaluation in pediatric patients. Dr. Nelson is uh, working on an evaluation and reduction of pediatric pain by non-pharmaceutical interventions. She also has other QI projects as well as the other residents uh, throughout this. Um, have multiple QI projects happening, not just these. Dr. Quay is increasing uh, dental home placement within uh, the Jefferson office. So hopefully, this is just like a little tease for everyone um, to uh, remind you that December 10th, we're going to actually see these residents kind of present uh, their, their projects that uh, hopefully have been completed or completed to their aim. So, What's the future of quality improvement here? If you have a project that you want to complete and think it is too big for just you, remember that the interns right now are looking for their capstone uh, during their first year. They're working on their EQIP, but looking for their capstone project. And so talking with them may help you complete your goals. With the development of our resident curriculum, we have also made it more accessible for faculty to lead their own projects. So I have some other faculty members that are working on projects, the QI projects within their own department that are utilizing our previously discussed kind of QI team to move forward with the, their ideas and goals, uh, which also goes back to, uh, you know, being able to publish and get their own literature. So please consider becoming a physician champion. Uh, we, uh, we are looking for six physician champions as we move forward with each year. So it would be a great, um, a great idea uh, if you have any thoughts or uh, could help the residents along the way. <clears throat> so improvement networks, there are plenty within the, within uh, everywhere, every institution, but uh, the AP has two in particular. Uh, the Quality Improvement Innovation Network, which works with outpatient uh, providers, and the Quality Network, uh, or the Value in the Inpatient Pediatrics Network, uh, who works with inpatient providers. If you join their listserv, you can be sent emails of future projects to be involved with and bring home to Caroline Children's and work through within our department and our section. And, uh, and the best part of all this is their QI projects are super easy. It's like Blue Apron, but for QI projects. So everything comes in a box, you just apply it, and then you're done. Um, so it, it is work. I don't want you to think that it's not work, but um, it is kind of already packaged um, for you, and a lot of the work has previously been done. Okay, so I encourage all of you to find quality improvement for opportunities within your practices. Reach out to myself or Dr. Baikani, and we can help you. Dr. McConnell didn't know that I was plugging her today, um, and she uh, isn't able to buzz in. So you might want to contact me first because she might be overwhelmed. <laughs> and then so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey, so what a great um, overview. I think that you, you really did a great job taking the mystery out of how to uh, really approach a QI project and, and gave a great example of how um, you ran through yours that you had done and the ones that the residents are doing. I would just like to say for the faculty, this is one of those things that is a win, 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 win. Like the, there's no loss here because you could, you could actually get MOC credit. You can actually get credit for your scorecard for scholarship. You get to improve something that you care about. You get to work with the residents and we have a great team that helps put this all together for you. And I think that it is a lovely way to really get involved in uh, and be the change that you want to be in the system. And uh, I really appreciate the way that you laid it out for everybody. Um, you made it, you made it uh, approachable. Well, I appreciate that. I, I, I very much think that it's uh, very approachable. I think it's uh, doable for everyone. Um, and 
And I, you know, if you have, if you're concerned, if you have a thought, if you have just a tiny idea, you know, send me an email and we'll, and we'll roll with it and we can hopefully get something off the ground. And I think and Tanya, it, uh, to your question, sorry, go ahead. No, I would say this will roll right into what we want to do with safety and quality moving forward. We've got a robust system within the inpatient setting and we will be moving this to the outpatient setting as well. So this would just tie in beautifully with that integration between ambulatory and inpatient settings. And I thank you again for a wonderful grand rounds. You're very welcome. Tanya, you're, uh, the, if you just go to the value and inpatient pediatrics network, you can utilize, uh, you can see if the nurses can sign up for that as well. I believe that you can. Um, I also think that they're in the nurse, uh, uh, in the nursing realm of uh, academies and sections, there are options um, for QI projects as well. And if they're developing nursing QI that you all see or the nurses see as important to the whole, we can absolutely implement them across uh, many different, you know, with the residents or the, uh, or the physicians. Um, it doesn't have to just be the nurse running it too. And we, our group would be happy to help any nurses with their projects also. Let's see. Can, uh, Dr. Tomez said, can you discuss one specific aspect of accomplishing a QI project in a busy pediatric practice that you have experienced, particularly utilizing staff? Um, okay, so I think what, what you're asking here is um, utilizing staff to accomplish a goal. So uh, are you able, so, for instance, with our ice cream project, we had our um, uh, our, head, our lead nurse, um, our CTL, was uh, an integral part of that project, and she was involved in collecting uh, the screeners and uh, entering data, and um, and so she played a key part along with myself. Um, uh, and, and and Dr. Henschel in kind of utilizing all of that process to getting it done. Uh, another way to answer your question would be, um, so uh, uh, utilizing staff. So our front staff, when we worked on ice cream, were, were the people that are handing out the ASQs and the MCHATs and things like that, and they're saying, please complete this. Um, it's important for uh, your child's development. We wrote some scripting if they had any questions, if the parents had any questions, they, they, the front staff had scripting available to them uh, to better answer um, those questions. And so I think that that's kind of what you're asking. Um, it is hard in a busy practice um, to get all of these team members together in one place uh, when we already have a bunch of meetings, obviously, um, these big projects were done pre-COVID where we're not already having lots of meetings or we can't meet. Um, so it does limit, uh, you know, our current situation does limit a little bit, but having virtual meetings like this one uh, is very simple and maybe uh, actually easier than getting everyone in a room. So if you're interested in being a physician champion or you have any other QI questions for me, uh, just shoot me an email and uh, I appreciate everyone coming and participating. Um, Dr. Smith said, yes, asking nurses to perform one more task can be hard and involving their interest probably helps, but they can be time constrained. Okay, I see what you're saying. So involving nurses. Yeah, so we ran across that with the ice cream project as well um, in our offices that um, the nurses are already doing a lot. So what we try to utilize is the front staff and handing them out. And instead of the nurse collecting them, really what we what we wanted was we, we produced some scripting for the nurses to say, hey, those screeners are really important for us to know how your kid is doing. So they're not adding anything necessarily, but we had scripting in place. That way um, they could uh, answer the questions that needed to be, or that if they were asked, they could answer those questions. Um, and so less of a, a role in all of that, but then that way when we had our team meetings, we, the nurses would come and say, hey, the, the, the parents are asking these questions, and then we did another PDSA cycle about how to address different concerns and questions, and then we developed scripting. So, yes, it is very difficult um, on the nurses, on the front staff, on the physicians, uh, the ACPs, everybody is time constrained, right? So adding something more is always a challenge. 
However, what we what I've found is that most of the time when you're looking at doing a quality project, sometimes not, but most of the time when you're looking at quality projects, all of the quality initiatives and your aim statements, especially with the resident group, that they've developed great aim statements as they've gone through, these are not we want to change the world today aim statements. These are we think every patient should have a dentist. These are, these are basic things. So it's easier to buy, to get people, nurses, front staff, every, uh, other physicians to buy in if you make it such a straightforward thing. Like we think that everyone should have a dental home. We think everyone should have uh, a, a uh, access to medical care with Dr. Griffin's project. We think every, every kid should understand what their pain is like to look at Dr. Nelson's project. So it, there are barriers that you have to address with time constraints, but if you made your project so easy that you're, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we should definitely do that. And a lot of times people don't know. If you, you know, when you talk to nurses and front staff and say, our patients don't see a dentist. They're 15, they've never seen a dentist. And we want to change that, they'll buy in. Because they think everybody goes to the dentist. They think everybody knows what their pain is like. They think everybody um, understands what a child's development is like, and they just don't. Um, so that's that's a way to kind of you want to frame it in a way that you know, can improve uh, outcomes. 